I'm going to bring on Dean Pinciotti, who is our Director of Rehabilitation here in Somerset. Thanks, Eric. Um, again, kudos, Eric. It puts a lot of work to getting this thing set up every year. Um, this is my second year of speaking here, and I'm going to hopefully give you some things that you can take back and start to implement um, going forward. So um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, I had to sit back and figure out how long I've been a physical therapist the other day. Patients ask me that all the time, and I think it's because of the color of my hair. But um, So I've, I've been around 34 years. I've done a lot of everything, hospital-based. I've done my own private practice. I've worked with some pro teams as well as with the uh, U.S. Olympic rowing team. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about something that the docs had talked about, re-tearing ACLs and some of the literature that's out there and some of the things you may want to consider with your athletes prior to letting them return to sport and what the literature kind of shows. Um, <clears throat> when I first started, I would say in the first 15 years of my career, I never saw a re-tear. And now it's more common than I like to talk about. Um, and I think that's something that um, there is probably some reason why we're seeing more re-tears. And I think the key is to um, have that understanding and have that conversation with that athlete, the parent. We really don't talk to coaches. Athletic trainers probably see, uh, talk to coaches more than, uh, let's say, physical therapists do. But to, it's a journey for these kids um, when they have a reconstruction. And you, I always say we're starting here and we're going forward. So it's not, it's not a race. And because some pro athlete went back after five, six months, doesn't mean that you're going to go back after five, six months. So hopefully over uh, the talk, you'll get an idea of how I feel and what the research shows as far as um, letting these athletes return back to sport safely. So again, some of our keys to maximizing our patient athlete outcomes and returning the athlete to sports, again, while minimizing their chance for re-injury. Uh, we'll go over some of the latest research and updated concepts, uh, specifically focusing on the knee. Um, the latest return to play statistics following knee surgery. Um, the keys in early post-op rehab and how to implement more advanced strengthening into the rehabilitation programs. Um, how many people here have heard of BFR? Okay, some people have. How many people have actually used it? Okay, a few people, not many. So I'm gonna just touch briefly on it. Eric had asked me to, to put something in my talk regarding BFR. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss that and what its role is maybe in rehab. Um, and then some re return to play criteria. As we've heard um, the doctors talk today about ACL surgery has been quite successful. Um, the key now is, you know, we know that there can be issues like anterior knee pain, loss of motion, prolonged quad weakness, and re-injury. So hopefully through this talk we can kind of lay out what's the most important thing we need to focus on with these athletes when we get them in the office or in the training room. Um, again, there's poor outcomes often associated with quadricep weakness, and I think the sooner we can get the swelling down and get the quadriceps firing, the better chance those athletes have of, of getting back to sports. Some of the research um, shows that a, a greater than 20% deficit in six months. So their quad is still getting stronger at that point. So to send somebody back with a 20% deficit, you know, I think you are really putting that athlete at risk for re-injury. Again, when I started years ago, kids did not go back like Dr. Bulky said. 11, 12 months after an ACL reconstruction. For some reason now, I think we think we can push them back sooner, and I think that's really a mistake. So we'll talk further about that. Again, a slower return to sport because their quads are still weak, um, a less than 85% poor performance with return to sport. Um, again, some of the self-reporting uh, that the patients have worse function uh, if they go back too soon because their quads are weak. And then over time, they've seen that 80% of the people can sometimes have uh, patellofemoral damage over time, which was reported by Wang. So one of the things to think about, it was a study done by uh, Grindham, is that 40% re-injury if they've returned less than nine months. If they returned after nine months, there was a 19% rate of re-injury um, for the ACL reconstructed athlete. Uh, four patients that went back less than uh, five months after we injured, were injured within the first two months of them returning to their sport. You heard Dr. Gatt discuss about how um, the people that went back, the first practice, the first week, they had a re -tear. It was on their opposite side, but that still um, is considered a, a re-tear 
even though it is on the contralateral side. And that's one thing um, I'll go over in the research is that a certain percentage of these are ipsilateral and a certain percentage are contralateral. Again, um, Rindam talked about for every month delayed, it reduced their re-injury rate by up to 51% up to that nine mar um, nine, ninth month mark. So again, there's no reason to send somebody back at six or seven months. But I understand if it's a high school athlete, um, they have four years. And you know, college athlete might have more and might be able to get redshirted. And high school athletes, that just doesn't happen. So um, it, it is quite um, a devastating injury and it is quite something that um, needs to be discussed if they want to get back um, to their sport. Now we talked about this and Dr. Buckley um, discussed this earlier. Is this due to time or poor rehab? Um, and I think we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, quadricep weakness strength is correlated to reduction in injury, um, reduction injury rate, and then 3% reduction in re-injury for every 1% increase in quadricep symmetry. So again, always here we are thinking about return to play, thinking about making sure their leg is strong enough to be ready to go back to play. 24% pass return to uh, sport testing at six months, 38% of those failed return to sport got re-injured. 6% of those passing also got re-injured. So I kind of come from the school that I think some of this is preventable with good rehab and thinking about when that athlete's ready to return to play. So I kind of want to go through six quick points here and discussing from point A to point B, point Z about how we're gonna uh, do this appropriately. We always like to see patients preoperatively in the office if we get that chance. Um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, a better orthopedic surgeon will send somebody if they don't have full motion, a lot of swelling, and a lot of pain. Because the research shows that if that athlete or that patient goes in for surgery and they don't have full motion and have a lot of swelling and a lot of quad weakness, their outcome is, is gonna be worse. And they're gonna be very challenged with the rehab of getting back. And sometimes it's, it has to be insurance issues um, as we deal with in therapy because you don't, if they have a certain plan, sometimes they're, they're wasting visits preoperatively. So if I think somebody has a crummy insurance plan, I will give them stuff to do on their own and then maybe bring them back a week later to check on them to make sure they're getting the range of motion back, they're, they're doing what I'm asking them to do, and that they're preparing themselves for surgery. I always tell patients, you know, if you, if you get your range of motion and your strength back and you go into surgery, you're gonna start up here. If you sit at home and wait for it in a month and you don't do anything and you get stiff, weak, tight, and swollen, you're gonna start out with your rehab down here and it just makes that return to play so much harder. So um, the research does back that up. We'll talk a little bit about um, controlling post-operative trauma, restoring mobility, um, talking about when we advance into strengthening program and then incorporating neuromuscular control and then some return to uh, sport testing. Um, Dr. Gatt um, had talked a little bit about KT-1000 testing. Um, we have this device here in the office. Um, we test people preoperatively. We'll test people maybe at six months and then it will test somebody before they go back to play. It's not the end all be all machine that says whether somebody's ready to go back to play. I think, it's, I think of it as like a pie. So it's a piece of the pie of that, that athlete's return to play. Plus I find value in it that if somebody is very unstable preoperatively, we got objective numbers that when I test them at some point, either re before they return to play or it's a, uh, two years from now they re-injure that knee. If I have their initial and their post-op KT, I can also do it again to recheck to see, well, you know, they got their MRI, they've had their X-ray, they've seen the orthopod, now we got a KT, maybe you get a CT scan. We got all that information to decide how bad is this injury and whether they need to be reoperated on. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice piece of uh, information, I think, that adds to um, best practice for these uh, athletes. You want to get range of motion, again, get it full prior to going into surgery. And also, I think coming in in a weird kind of way, it reduces the patient's fear of what's going to happen postoperatively. Um, so many patients, they end up at the front desk. They've never been to therapy. They just had the reconstruction. They come in. Sometimes those, those kids, it takes them two weeks to, for them to trust you, um, that you're not gonna hurt them, they're in pain, they've never been to therapy, it's all foreign to them. So even coming in for a preoperative, even if it's a one-time visit, I think helps reduce their fear post-op and uh, reduction of some of the post-operative issues as I've discussed. So in the first 
one to three weeks, we're working on controlling this post-op trauma, as I call it. So they have significant pain in effusion. We'll talk a little bit about how the negative effects that effusion has on the knee joint. Um, again, main contributor to peer, uh, pain and fear avoidance, loss of motion, and especially emphasizing extension. Um, I'm not worried about their flexion when they first come in. It's, we have to get that knee fully straight. Some of the docs use a hinge brace. Some docs use a knee immobilizer. And I'll share, again, anecdotal um, what I do. Uh, I had somebody in the office just this week. Uh, they came in. They were in a knee immobilizer. And the knee immobilizer has a bend to the back of the knee. So I take that thing off and I push on a treatment table and I make sure that thing is perfectly flat. Because if you're telling that athlete, get your, you know, get your knees straight, get your knees straight, get your knees straight, then they go on that thing and their knees bent 10 degrees or 5 degrees. So we're almost like fighting an uphill battle. So if we want to emphasize extension, then we want to straighten that brace out. It's very simple. It's a piece of metal. Some, some therapists I've seen take the metal out so it, it, the knee does go straight. And we'll talk a little bit about when we take athletes out of that knee immobilizer and let them walk without the uh, knee immobilizer. Again, with the uh, swelling that they're going to have, they're going to have this reflexive inhibition of the quads um, on the surgical site. And you know they'll have poor gait that we need to work on that as well. So Mangene's work at uh, Cincinnati, uh, he injected his own knee, which was, um, did not have an injury, with 40 cc's of, of, of saline solution, put himself on a Cybex machine and tested his strength before he injected it and then kept injecting his knee and then kept testing his strength. He showed that there was a 50% reduction in peak torque of his quadriceps on isokinetic testing with just 40 cc's of fluid, which isn't much. So again, something to keep in mind when we talk about swelling reduction and getting that swelling down. So we want to do that as, as soon as possible. These are some of our treatments we're going to do in week one to, to control this uh, post-operative trauma, retrograde massage, cryotherapy, EMS to the quads to try and get them to start to fire if they're having difficulty engaging their quads. If they can't get that knee straight, they're going to have difficulty engaging the quad. And as well as they're going to have a lot of fatigue with walking with crutches. You know, when I, when I think about treating patients, I, I don't not only treat evidence-based, but I, th I treat experience-based. So I think trying to take those two ideas and, and weave those together so that you can get the best outcome for that patient. Um, again, quad isometrics, whether you're using some form of a biofeedback, uh, straight leg raises. Uh, we do a lot of Swiss ball training to work on motion, um, work on um, doing bridging with the Swiss ball, doing knees to chest, just to get that mobility going and, and on a constant basis. We work a lot on PNF and the hip musculature early on, and again, using biofeedback to try and get them to emphasize the quad. So here's some, some tid, tidbits I like to share with people just so that they know, they don't have questions on, again, when to get them out of the brace and things like that. So I tell all the therapists, you don't take that knee immobilizer off until they can either have a five or less degree extensor leg when they do a straight leg raise on the table. If they lift their leg up and they have a 20 degree extensor leg, they have to stay in that knee immobilizer because my feeling is you move them out of that, then they're going to start to have some, some buckling, but more functional instability from quad weakness. So it's also one of the things that can help motivate an athlete to, to really work hard with the exercises because they hate wearing the knee immobilizer. So if we can give them a goal to shoot for is being able to do a straight leg raise with zero or five degree extensor leg. Again, something very measurable, objective, um, not going, well, it's uh, time-based. Let's see, it's uh, three weeks after surgery. Let's get rid of the knee immobilizer. If they're walking around on that weak quad, they're just going to infuse the knee, and then we're going to set up that scenario of pain, inflammation, muscle shutdown, pain, weakness, inflammation, and it, we're just going to be working uphill the whole way. Um, again, taking athletes after ACL reconstruction through a functional progression from their two crutches to one crutch to no crutches. I think, again, to go from two to none, that, that athlete will walk horribly with a bent knee gait pattern. They'll have all kinds of issues with their back. Um, so again, try to think function with these things. Uh, we focus a lot on patellofemoral joint um, mobilization early on in rehab. Um, again, the gold standard of a patella tendon, um, a ACL reconstruction. That patella, that, that patella has to be mobilized. I've even seen it where somebody's had a hamstring and their patella gets bound down. You gotta work it as well. So working the patellofemoral joint in all directions, but especially superior and inferiorly with mobilization. 
One of the things we talk about with this time-based uh, return to sport, uh, we've had patients that go back to see the surgeon and they're like, oh, you're at six months, you can begin running now. And meanwhile, through your rehab, you may not have them ready to return to running because maybe you struggled early on with getting their strength back or getting their swelling down. So I think that's where when uh, Dr. Buckley talks about it, it can't be just all time-based. Uh, I think he hits the point well that the athlete has to be able to do something that I've kind of used in the office over the years that it's, has pretty much stood the test of time. I will do a single leg squat at the end of the treatment table with um, giving them manual resistance. And if they can do a single leg squat, 12 to 15 reps with good control, meaning they're not shaking, they're not all over the place, no pain, then I think they're ready to begin jogging. So again, I, I think just be able to arbitrarily say it's six months, let's begin jogging. I think again, it's just doing the, the athlete a disservice when it comes to return to, to athletics. Again, uh, restoring mobility. Um, again, we talked about extension is important and that's what we're focusing on and getting the quads to fire uh, within those first three weeks. So as we begin into our strengthening program, we're doing a combination of closed and open chain exercises. I know years ago it was all open chain. Then we got into, oh, we gotta do closed chain. Um, again, I've kind of come from an eclectic approach that open and closed chain has their purpose if you use it appropriately. Um, so I'm not going to do 45 to zero degrees of knee extension on a leg extension machine. That's just not something I'm going to do with a post-op ACL. But we'll start them doing um, leg press on like a total gym, then progressing them to a leg press machine, then having them do squats. So again, there's a functional progression through the exercise regime, so that makes sense. Um, to not go from um, having them do some range of motion to now let's go do squats. Yeah, it's just that, that, that athlete or that patient's gonna really struggle with that, that exercise. So we're taking them from something where they can be partial weight bearing, go through that mechanism of weight bearing through that joint, whether it's with bilateral or single leg activities, that's what we really need to move them through. So again, squats at the top of this, but it's really, um, there's, there's a lot of other things you have to do before letting them go into doing squats. Um, thinking of the hinge and all the posterior hip musculature and working on glute muscle and glute strength, um, again, step, step ups or lunging in multiple planes, horizontal pushing and pulling and vertical pushing and pulling, that's how we're trying to improve that. One of the things I've started looking into more these days is some uh, rehab periodization. Uh, again, it's, we're gonna start off with linear loading progression, so we're doing our two sets of 10 of an exercise, then maybe we progress to three sets of 10 and then we increase the weight and then maybe back to two sets of 10 and work there as, work the rehab in sets of, uh, you know, two to three sets of 10. Now I think I'm trying to, you know, mix it up a little bit after doing research for this talk and, and try to mix it up a little bit with doing different types of, of lifts and different types of exercises, maybe four sets of five to build strength. And then we're doing like three sets of 12 to build endurance. So something to think about when you're designing that rehab program for that athlete of not just, first of all, three sets of 10 get boring after a while, quite honestly, um, but to, to challenge that athlete uh, with more dynamic things. So this could be something that I kind of mapped out here. Again, month one to two, you're doing your two sets of 10, progressive loading, uh, low percentage of max reps. And then as you work down through the months, you can see here that they're working on, again, at month five, four to five sets of main lifts, and then uh, two sets of 12 of secondary lifts. Again, we're working into trying to go from hypertrophy to strength to power with these athletes and preparing them to return to sport. So talk a little bit about um, blood flow restriction training, which some of the research shows could be beneficial um, early on in therapy and then maybe in the late stages of, of, of rehab. Um, it, it, was very, it was made popular with the military when um, the soldiers would come back from Afghanistan and they just couldn't get muscles to fire and they started trying this uh, BFR with them and they started noticing that they were able to you know, build some strength with that with, with uh, less uh, resistance but with um, occluding the uh, return flow of the blood back to the heart. So again, it's work to failure with less load and less weight and it it's allows for uh, greater gains at submaximal loads. Again, it res restricts the venous return back to the heart, kind of tricks the body into working harder than an aggressive load, and it has um, probably some rehab applications. Now, I will tell you that looking into it, preparing for the talk, 
talking to a couple of therapists that work here that have worked with it before. I mean, I think you have to have um, the right kind of BFR unit um, because I think sometimes some of the research I looked up talked about, you know, you just can't put a blood pressure cuff on somebody and, and think that you're, you know, there are some contraindications for that. You got to make sure that um, you have the proper um, compression before before doing these techniques. So again, um, maybe you'll use this with someone when they're uh, plateaued or having issues to try and do some training BFR, um, endurance-based rehab to fatigue, and it takes usually about four weeks till you'll start seeing some results. Um, and again, the goal is not to do this forever. And again, um, maybe the whole idea is to, to transition that patient from BFR into uh, regular resistive training. Some of the contraindications to think about here at the bottom is, you know, medical history of vascular compromise, clotting disorders, or elevated risk of embolism, or renal compromise, or hypertension. So, um, uh, some of the things that they've shown can help is a, wire, a wider cuff uh, when you're doing this technique, um, limb pressure occlusion, um, and the body needs to be performed in the position that they're going to exercise. So, if they're going to sit and, let's say, for an example, do leg extension. You want to um, get their pressure measured with them in sitting, not in standing. If they're going to do like a leg press motion, you want to put them in that position. Or they're going to ride the bike, you put them in that position. So um, this kind of set uh, training pressures for the leg would be 40 to 80 percent um, occlusion, and for the upper extremity is 30 to 60 percent. So um, this was reported recently in JOSBT uh, in May of uh, this year. So getting back to that rehab program, combining strength and neuromuscular control. Um, I just don't have people do leg press till the cows come home or leg curls or mid-range leg extensions. You have to start putting them into functional positions. One of the things that um, the next speaker, Steve, is going to go over um, is a lot of video. I took a lot of my video out when I saw what he was talking about. So um, trying to sh demonstrate um, on video, I had a lot of stuff as far as uh, functional ex exercises and watching how they land and how they jump and how they move. I think one of the things that can be helpful with, uh, with an athlete when you return to sport, when you do all this testing, is also videotaping them. Because um, some, the, some of the research shows that if you actually watch yourself land instead of the therapist or the trainer saying, no, don't let your knees go in or you got to land with um, absorbing the landing, um, if they can see that on a video and everybody's got some sort of camera on their phone now, you can just videotape that with them so that they can kind of learn it. And I think there's a better connection between them understanding what you're trying to get them to do um, versus just keep telling them what you want them to do. Um, now we're going to manipulate these variables with the neuromuscular control. First is starting linear, lateral, diagonal, then rotational. Go from stable um, environment to an unstable environment, whether you're on a uh, air X pad or whether you're on a BOSU ball or some sort of unstable environment. We're always going from starting with two legs to see if they're comfortable with that exercise, progressing to one leg, then again going from slow to fast. Um, so again, gradual return to sports and activities. The rehab progression is important. Strengthening is the key with especially the quads and the, and the, uh, the hamstrings as well as in the glutes. Want to work on neuromuscular control, go from jogging to running to cutting plyometrics that Steve will talk about, going from two leg um, activities to single leg activities in various planes of motion. So uh, myth, um, is time a good variable for sending somebody back to sports? And again, I think the answer is no to that. Research tells us not. Um, studies uh, show time-based return to sports definitely is not the way to go. But going back too early does increase the risk of re-injury, re-tear, ipsilateral, even the contralateral side. So how do we decide? Um, I think just, just letting somebody go back without doing some sort of functional testing um, is really a disservice to the parents, to the athlete, um, and to even the surgeon. So um, having some form of uh, return to sport functional testing or strength testing um, is, I think is very important. So some of the research that was done here um, at the Journal of Sports Medicine 2018, they had um, Level one athletes who were involved in uh, level one and two sports, which was cutting, um, lateral movement like uh, tennis, rugby, football, ice hockey. Um, level one athletes, 
80% and 84% of the past group at six months returned to participation in the same pre-injury activity level at 12 and 24 months after their reconstructive respectively. Of those, 44.2 and 46.4 of the fail group returned at 24 and 24, uh, 12 and 24 months. The past group, greater than 90% on all criteria, the fail group was people who had less than 90% in these tests that they performed. So they found that the testing, the single leg hop tests and their uh, quad isometric testing uh, were, were keys in uh, letting that athlete go back to sp uh, sport. Uh, the global uh, rating score is a subjective questionnaire that the athlete would fill out. So again, uh, the return to participation in the same pre-injury activity level at 12 and 24 months after the reconstruction was higher in those athletes who passed the criteria compared to those who failed. The hop tests were consistent predictors at 12 and 24 months after the reconstruction. They found the single leg hop, the triple hop, and the six meter timed hop were the most consistent. The crossover triple hop was not as consistent. So again, something very simple that you can do in your training room, take a tape measure, and, and you know, again, testing them prior to letting them go on either to that next phase of rehab or back to sport. Um, th uh, this group, uh, was, this was published in JOSPT February 2019. They did a systematic review with a meta-analysis looking at all different uh, articles of people that uh, research return to sport and re-injury rates. Uh, Wiggins et al. determined that 23% uh, incidence of second ACL in athletes under the age of 25. I mean, that, that number seems so large to me. And you even heard some of the docs say it could be anywhere between 15 and 30% of, of re after an ACL reconstruction. So again, I think my biggest thing is people going back too soon and then maybe not going back strong enough or without enough proprioception control. And I think if we can focus on those three things, hopefully we'll start seeing these numbers come down. Um, uh, again, Grindham also said no consensus on the optimum timing for return to sport. But again, he did talk about this for every month, uh, up to nine months. Uh, if you delayed it, it reduced their chance of retearing by 51%. So again, we got biological healing, neuromuscular control, proprioceptive training, strength training, recovery. It can take up to two years uh, for normalization following an ACL reconstruction. The highest incidence of second ACL injury is between six months and two years. So again, if we're letting people go back too soon, we're just putting them at risk. Returning to the sports prior to nine months following ACL is detrimental to the patient. So some of the other things to think about, we talked a little bit about psychological um, impairments. Uh, if, if they're nervous about going back to sport, they're going to have an issue with being confident in that leg. So again, most studies show that individuals following the ACL are more concerned with the uh, fear of re-injury. Uh, Christus et al, they went through, uh, they had 158 male pro athletes, 65% of, of the patients had a re-injury within six months of discharge uh, from therapy. Um, if they had a lower hamstring to quad ratio, they were gr at greater risk. And then for every 10% decrease um, in ratio, they had 10 times, tenfold uh, higher risk of re-injury. So again, athletes who did not meet the return to sport cr criteria had a fourfold greater risk of sustaining an ACL graft rupture. So again, again, these are the, the thing that also to keep about these these research um, and articles is that it could have been different doctors, different therapists, different protocols. So there's really not a good one out there right now that it's all the same surgical procedure, same surgeon, and then the same rehab program that you really get a, a good idea. So again, we talk about isometry, maybe with where the graft is positioned. Um, and again, is that an issue with if the graft isn't put in the right spot? Um, does that put the graft more at risk? So again, I think it's something to think about. So again, this Delaware, Oslo, Norway, they're doing a lot of stuff with, um, that's where a lot of this um, ACL prevention programs have started. Um, they even have a, um, a research project going on where they're taking people without um, the torn ACLs and trying to get them to go back because they've noticed that there's such a high incidence of re-tears there that they have just the amount of injury if somebody's tore their ACL and went back to sport after rehab that they're trying a whole group of people just letting them go back with uh, after training. So again, 
um, trying to make sure that you know you, you get the strength back. Again, one this this study showed one percent increase in quad limb symmetry index correlated to a three percent reduction in, in injury risk. Um, Another study here talking about, um, they concluded that the patients returning to sports six months after an ACL reconstruction um, had greater risk of injury on the contralateral side is what this study showed with SOTA. So um, again, it's, uh, the authors really are showing that athletes going back too soon um, are putting themselves at greater risk. Um, so the last slide here I want to talk about is just sort of what to think about when you want to Somebody let somebody go back to return to sport again. We're here. We will do a, a KT 1000 uh, We want to have their uh, Their test be two mil less than three millimeters uh, in bilateral comparison. I uh, will do the the four top uh, hop tests 90% um, function of three of these four uh, would be a favorable uh, a test um, if you if you're familiar with FMS a white balance test Again, an isokinetic, if you have access to it, or an isometric testing, 90% or higher in bilateral comparison. The self-reported outcome surveys um, are important for the uh, athlete to fill out. Videotaping we talked about for landing and cutting to evaluate the uh, knee valgus. And then again, think about returning to play after nine months and condition that athlete and not thinking about having them go back to 11 or 12 months uh, post-operatively. Okay, thank you.